Thank you all for being here. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Jane Wilkinson, the Executive Director of the Koch Institute here at MIT. And I want to just tell you a little bit about the Koch. Um, you know, what brought me across the street, I, most of my career has been in genomics. I was at the Broad Institute for 18 years. Um, was the disruptive way of thinking about cancer research that I think the Koch thinks about. You know, most cancer research centers are usually in the basement of a cancer hospital. What makes the Koch really unique is that half of our faculty are engineers and half of our faculty are biologists. So we have a very disruptive, I'm going to use that word a lot today because I think this entire meeting is really focused on that. And, um, Another reason that I came to the Coke as well was, um, you know, I have a passion for the unusual, the rare, the unique. Um, I actually almost took a, a, a job in, focused on rare genetic diseases. You know, those were the two offers that I had. So, you know, that passion for the unusual um, and also a love of troublemakers. And I think you will find um, that, you know, the way we think about cancer research is quite troublemaking. So um, 18 months ago, I got a call from my very, very, very good friend, Tina Kelly here. Um, and Tina texted me and said, I have appendiceal cancer. And the first thing I did was exactly all of those things that Steve and Kathy just said, a what? In the appendix? Huh. So when this project came about with Steve and Kathy, it was an absolute no-brainer for me to pour my heart and soul into this. Um, and I want to thank Tina for being here. Um, I also want to introduce you to Kari Painter. Kari is sitting next to Tina. Um, they're both Brodies, by the way, both geneticists, both work across the street at the Broad Institute. Um, Kari um, was diagnosed with a very rare type, type of cancer called angiosarcoma. So I, I just feel that all of these really rare things actually don't really feel that rare once you start, once you start communicating with the community. So I'm here for you both, and obviously I'm here for Steve and Kathy. Um, you, you've all now watched the video from Kathy. You know why we're here. You know, I think of Kathy as being this amazing catalyst for these conversations to happen here. But it's not just about Kathy, it's about the entire community. And it's also about thinking about um, rare cancers. I'm going to give you a very short introduction to appendiceal cancer, and then we're going to move to this panel discussion where we're going to do a much better, deeper dive on the biology. But for those of you who aren't oncologists and you're here thinking about the finance models and the funding models and, and the policy models, appendiceal cancer is really rare. It's thought to affect about one or two people per million every year. However, um, recent data is showing that it's actually becoming more common. And it's also more common in people um, between the ages of 50 and 55. But it can actually happen at any age. So a couple of things I want to throw out. There's currently only 10 open clinical trials for appendiceal, just 10. You know, any of you can go on the NCI clinical trials website. You can find hundreds and hundreds of um, trials ongoing for some of the more common cancers. But right now, an appendiceal patient only has an option of 10 trials. And you're going to see some more videos today um, from patients and from caregivers. The thing that I've heard while connecting to the patients and the caregivers, and by the way, I thought it was really important to bring their message in here. I think it keeps us grounded. And I'm just going to say it out aloud. It knocks us off our pedestals, and it makes us remember why we're here and what we're working on. Um, a lot of frustration around how their cancer, appendiceal cancer, is just lumped in with some other cancers that happen to be in the vague same area. You know, you, you often hear comments of, I'm being treated like I have colon cancer. I'm being treated like I have ovarian cancer. And frustrations around how close enough is actually not good enough. So really, really, really focusing on this particular type of cancer. So our mission today, um, is to think about a framework where all of us here can come together to work on this, how we can think about including other people over time, and then long after this workshop ends, what are the lessons learned, and how can we make our conversations 
um, and our thoughts applicable to other rare diseases. Um, Steve mentioned there's going to be a questionnaire. You know, this is where we really want to solicit your ideas for how we continue to move this forward. I don't want the day to end and for us all to grab a gin and tonic and walk out of the door and it's over. You know, I really want this to be the beginning of something. So with that, I am going to ask my amazing science collaborators to join me up on stage. What they're going to do is they're going to give you um, a 10 minute ish. I'm giving you the, the stern look here. An overview of what, how they're thinking about appendicil cancer right now. It's almost like a state of the union review of appendicil cancer. And then we'll go into a panel discussion. I really want to keep this interactive. I want to keep this informal. Um, so welcome aboard. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Uh, I want to talk to a little bit about what we're doing at the NIH. I'm a surgical oncologist at the National Cancer Institute. Um, and uh, of course, I have a particular clinical and research interest in appendiceal cancer. So in order to stay within my 10 minutes, I want to keep going. Um, so what we are trying to fill is the translational research space that I think we can uniquely occupy as surgeons. And what we are working on is ex vivo tumor modeling in a way that really preserves the tumor microenvironment. So this is an intraoperative laparoscopic image that's fairly typical that we see in patients when we do staging or screening laparoscopies. And you can see that uh, the peritoneal surface has this pale dots that are studding with cancer. So what we aim to do is harvest these tumor cells but also everything that comes along with those. And so we want to capture not just tumor cells, but the cancer-associated fibroblasts, epithelial cells, the extracellular matrix, as well as the immune cells that are infiltrating these tumors. And we think that this recapitulates this microenvironment uh, much more reliably and also provides an opportunity for interrogation. It's immediately translatable to that patient. Um, and I think that this 3D architecture and the relative polarity, especially of an epithelial malignancy that starts at the inner surface of the hollow viscous and grows and penetrates outward, is important to preserve in order to really say, is this signal something that we can rely on and work from? So to that end, we've developed the SMART system the sustainable microenvironment uh, analysis for resected tissues. So that way we can harvest this tissue, put it in the system, and keep it alive over time. Um, and so this is a schematic of that. Uh, by having the system as a closed system, what we can also do is do deeper dives into the tumor tissue itself. We can dissociate it and run flow cytometry and other uh, correlative studies. And then we can also study what's in the perfusate of this closed system over time. And so, you know, it's uniquely tailored for peritoneal surface malignancies. When we think about a complete cytoreduction or an optimal cytoreduction, that means we're getting everything down to about 2.5 millimeters in size. And chemotherapy or heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy in particular is ideally suited to try and target these smaller nodules that maybe cannot be removed without extensive small bowel resections or um, other cytoreductive procedures that might be too morbid for patients. And, uh, but this platform allows us to study it and be able to look at what's happening in these small tumors and is the HIPEC achieving what we think it is or what we hope it is. So, and it allows us to then also run these other uh, studies based off of that. So this is um, a video from a laparoscopy where we put the camera in and we can see all of the studying on the peritoneal surface. What we do is we harvest the peritoneum itself in this way, this is exactly how fast I operate, in case you're all wondering. <laughs> and so we remove this tissue through one of the ports and then essentially immediately put it on the system. So this is in a back table in the operating room. One of the unique aspects of the National Cancer Institute is we do not have to have pathology get first pass at our tissue. What we want to do is minimize the warm ischemic time and therefore, we can say that that signal that we're seeing in the system is going to be ideally more reliable than if it's sitting in the frozen section room for 20 minutes before anybody gets to touch it. So these, the peritoneal tissue is mounted onto these modified Boykin chambers and tied down. You can see these are examples of some of the tumor-bearing peritoneum. The middle one is particularly good where you see that's about a two millimeter implant in the center of the platform. And then this allows us to evaluate this over time. And this is um, 
a picture of what the smart system roughly looks like. You know, we have different components as far as a perfusion pump, uh, peristaltic perfusion pump in order to move the perfusate through. We use the patient's own serum as the perfusate, uh, and we're able to keep this going for about four days and even beyond uh, ex vivo. The reason why that four days in our minds is adequate is that if you're going to see a response, say if you introduce a chemotherapeutic agent or another therapeutic agent, if you don't see a response within 24 hours, you're going to be unlikely to most, uh, in most cases. Um, and so this has oxygenators, gas mixers, and everything to, again, maintain that viability on the bench. Um, one of the important things is what happens in, to these tumor tissues over time in the system? Is it just degrading and then we're having a lot of noise because of that degradation over time? And really at that four day mark, everything is quite reliable from an immunohistochemical staining standpoint and also transcriptomics and proteomics. And so that four day mark is, is uh, ideal. And that's also about where our limit is if we're using the patient's own serum. You know, we can only draw so much blood off of a patient for research purposes, uh, but we can also extend this by using uh, donor blood if we need to, if, if that immune aspect or if the uh, serum aspect is not as important for the question uh, at the time. So one of the other things that we can do with this platform is look at these tumor tissues and perform live imaging and look at what is happening with the tumor cells, with the immune cells. So this is you know, two very active, you know, actively different uh, tumors on the on the right, we have a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, type of sarcoma, which tends to be relatively immune indolent. So we see that the immune cells tagged in red aren't really doing very much with the, with the tumor cells in green. Whereas on the left, we have an appendiceal cancer where clearly those immune cells are much more active within that tumor microenvironment. And we can see that movement over time. <laughs> And then, you know, one of the issues with live imaging is just we only have so many color channels that we can evaluate at one time. We can get beyond that with multiplex imaging. So after these tissues have been in the smart system and we fix them, then we can put them through OCT blocks and run multiple sections through various levels and then put that all together and see what is this three-dimensional tumor microenvironment. And we can uh, that way filter a lot more uh, information through this in order to get a better idea of, of that 3D spatial relationship of different tissues. Uh, and the other is that we can extend this live imaging for a long period of time. So up to about eight hours, we can see the movement of cells within this tissue within the system. And you know, I think that if we're going to be looking at responses to therapeutics introduced into the system, this is going to be an important aspect to see. Um, uh, how durable that response is. is it, are we just stunning cells and then they bounce back to what they were doing after a couple hours? Or are we seeing a sustained effect uh, with that treatment? Uh, the other thing is that we can stimulate the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And so this is a drug that um, is paired with an anti pdl one uh, and a TGF-beta receptor. And we can see that with that um, M7824 introduced into the system, we can stimulate those tumor infiltrating lymphocytes to be active. Um, and we can also see even immune cell mediated tumor cell killing in this live imaging platform. One of the keys is also we know that with somebody who has extensive cancer, we might have different clones, we might have different expression of, um, gen you know, from a genomics perspective, from a RNA perspective, and therefore proteomics. Um, and there's heterogeneity in, in a single patient's tumor. And so we'll see a differential response too. And so one of the uh, aspects that we can use is say, we have a patient with a tumor cell or a tumor nodule, we can give a therapeutic and evaluate why is some of the um, tumor responding to that treatment, and why is some of it not responding? And this is another aspect of heterogeneity. You know, we don't see a uniform response a lot of times. And the question is, why are some responding? And is there a way that we can add a sequential treatment or something else to target those cells that are relatively resistant within this tumor microenvironment? So, you know, where do we think that the, the smart systems niche is? And so I think that a lot of that is, we, we think of this as an immediate preclinical model. You know, this is not going to be a high throughput drug screening platform, not like organoids. This is going to be something for a specific patient where the product of a drug screening protocol can then be tested in the system and we can interrogate that tumor microenvironment and look at 
uh, and tailor it to the chemotherapeutic or to the therapeutic agent. For example, if we're going to be looking at an immune therapy approach, our studies of the tumor microenvironment are going to be fundamentally different than if we're looking at something that's cytotoxic chemotherapy, for example. Or if we're looking at small molecule inhibitors, again, that analysis is going to be tailored to that um, agent. And this, again, for appendiceal malignancies and other malignancies, this is a way to try and get more towards personalized medicine, personalized treatment for patients in a way that is more immediately translatable. Because if this can inform how we are going to treat that patient, that's the goal. Um, but again, collaboration with outside groups is really critical for this to, to work because <clears throat> we're not a phase one group. We are a phase two group. So uh, there are other folks who are going to be running you know, phase one dose finding studies and doing it better than us as sort of, because it's we're surgical oncologists. But we, I think, have a, a specific role as far as phase two trials. So something that has um, some preclinical information and has a dose, we can introduce that into the system and study that in a different way. Um, and again, I think that, that tumor heterogeneity is really important because one of the question is, we, a lot of us have heard about immu immunotherapy as far as treatment of other cancers. And one question is, how can we incorporate immunotherapy and in what sequence? Should we be doing cytotoxic chemo first and then immunotherapy? Should it be the other way around? Should it be co-administration? And if so, which agents? And I think this is one of the ways that we can start to ask and ideally answer some of those questions. And so I have uh, one clinical trial, I guess that's one of the 10 out there, um, where we're looking at bidirectional therapy using paclitaxel, which has been around for a very long time, but um, we're using it with nilotinib. And nilotinib has really been um, used for hematologic malignancies as a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. But what the uh, NCI Almanac study did was look at all the FDA-approved drugs and combine them and look for synergy. And so nilotinib and paclitaxel were synergistic both in cell lines and in PDX models. And then that directly led us to say, well, if paclitaxel IV and oral nilotinib are synergistic, what about intraperitoneal paclitaxel? And so we're looking at um, this trial opened uh, September 1st last year. I've had multiple patients I've screened for the trial. And Fortunately for them, and not necessarily for the trial perspective, they, they failed screening because they didn't have enough disease to actually be able to study for this. But um, what we have had is, this is our first patient with a goblet cell appendiceal adenocarcinoma, who on the left you see pre-treatment images of extensive serosal disease and mesenteric disease. And this is an interval laparoscopy, and we can see a, at least a partial, and I would say pretty pretty strong clinical response. And we can really only evaluate this by laparoscopy, and that's one of the limitations. It's not something that serum markers or CAT scans are going to be able to really tell us, is this patient responding or not? But I think that this is uh, an encouraging initial finding uh, on this trial, and we're looking forward to being able to treat more patients on this. Uh, of course, I would be very happy to have more screen failures for the right reasons. But. With that, so that I stay within my 10 minutes, which I you did great. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people to thank. Too many to name all at once, um, but of course, it takes a village for for something like this. So, thank you again. Hi, everybody. I'm Dave Ryan. I'm the chief of Humonk at Mass General. I'm the clinical director of the Cancer Center. Um, I apologize. I emailed my slides to the wrong person, and and I'll just talk off the cuff about appendix cancer. Give you a little overview from a clinical perspective. Um, so I've been in practice in GI cancer for 25 years, uh, 20 of which with, with my good friend Jim Cusack in surgery. And I just, I want to level set just a little bit from a clinical perspective and talk and give you a sense of what it's like to take care of appendiceal cancer patients and where the, where the real issues are. So the first I would say is let's discuss about which patient we're treating. And so there are four essential different types of cancers that arise in the appendix. There's neuroendocrine cancers, which we're not talking about. In 25 years of practice, I've almost never taken care of somebody who's died from a neuroendocrine cancer of the appendix that started in the appendix. It happens, mostly it's a surgical phenomenon. It comes out with the appendix during a right hemicolectomy or an appendectomy, and it's usually not a problem. So I don't think it's an unmet need. Uh, then there's uh, goblet cell adenocarcinomas, which used to be called goblet cell carcinoids, the strangest tumor on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. The pathologist will tell you on one half of the block is carcinoid or neuroendocrine cancer, on the other half of the block is adenocarcinoma. 
In 25 years of practice, I've had a bunch of people die from goblet cell uh, adenocarcinomas. It's never the carcinoid that metastasizes. So when uh, Jim goes in and takes out the metastatic disease, it's always an adenocarcinoma component that looks indistinguishable from a regular adenocarcinoma of the appendix, which leads us to what we're really talking about today, which is adenocarcinoma of the appendix. Now, adenocarcinoma of the appendix exists along a spectrum from low-grade adenocarcinoma, classically creates a ton of mucin in the belly, often called pseudomyxoma peritonei, uh, now called adenomucinosis sometimes. It's just a ton of snot in the belly, like for lack of a better term, with small amounts of solid tumor. Now it exists all the way over here to another spectrum, which is poorly differentiated carcinoma, sometimes signet ring cell, adenocarcinoma. Uh, if, if it's super poorly differentiated, you've lost your adenocarcinoma features, but it's, it essentially forms glands. And that behaves for all intents and purposes like colon cancer. Looks like colon cancer, stains like colon cancer, behaves like colon cancer, responds to chemotherapy like colon cancer. Now, patients exist along the spectrum. There's even people who have low-grade adenocarcinoma with components of high-grade, particularly over time as they progress. Sometimes they're left, if they've had multiple surgeries to take out that mucin, they're left with the poorly differentiated component or the high-grade adenocarcinoma after 10, 15 years. And that's what they wind up dying from uh, for the most part. Now, the low-grade mucinous tumors are easy to pick up. On a CT scan, everybody who's taking care of these patients can know immediately are they super low-grade or not, because the, the mucin looks different on a CT scan than standard solid tumor adenocarcinoma, which causes a lot of caking, free-flowing uh, fluid that we call ascites, but not this huge amount of mucin. Now, the pathologist may call us and say there's mucin in the tumor, in the actual cell, but unless you see globules of mucin outside uh, the uh, solid tumor, it's not a low-grade appendiceal mucinous neoplasm. It's more than likely, if you see tons of solid disease uh, on the CT scan, it's a adenocarcinoma that's gonna behave for all the world like colon cancer. So on the clinical side, what people wind up dying from is their belly fills up, um, and they basically die of inanition, essentially, because their GI tract just shuts down. So when I sit down and I explain to somebody who's dying of appendiceal cancer, why are they dying? I say because your GI tract, we actually, GI oncologists, look at the whole intestinal tract as an organ, and you can't live without a liver, you can't live without lungs, you can't live without a functional GI tract. And eventually, you, have, you die from either, uh, you can't get adequate calories in, and you effectively uh, shut down the GI tract, but usually what you wind up dying from is sepsis, because the GI uh, tract gets, um, uh, the structure of the GI tract uh, gets broken, you have uh, intra-abdominal sepsis, and eventually people wind up dying uh, uh, of sepsis. Often on TPN, because their GI tract doesn't work anymore. Now, what's the difference between the two that we think from a, from a clinical perspective? So the low-grade appendiceal tumors we think that debulking surgery makes a difference. The appendix surgeons still believe that HIPEC makes a difference, and it might for people with a ton of mucin. It's, it's, a, it's a concept that, that most medical oncologists kind of shrug. Most of the surgeons who do this really believe in HIPEC for a true, a low-grade mucinous appendiceal neoplasm. Honestly, there's a lack of data, I don't know. For the high-grade tumors, we know that HIPEC has limited eff efficacy. And we know that because there was a randomized controlled study done in Europe of people getting complete cytoreductive surgery where you take out all the disease and, and you give people either HIPEC or not, and everybody gets standard chemotherapy. Um, and the HIPEC had absolutely no impact on, on overall survival. People debate, the surgeons and the big believers in heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy debate whether there was some small effect, but effectively, whatever effect there was, was tiny <laughs> and, and not statistically significant. So you can tell that um, from my perspective, I've moved on from HIPEC for high-grade disease. I am, however, a huge believer in surgery because there's a tail on the curve. About 15% of people, if you can resect all the disease, are actually cured. Now, we've known that for years in colon cancer where um, it was thought that if you had peritoneal disease, it was never curable. But if Dr. Cusack can take all your cancer out, guess what? There's a tail on the curve. It's curable. And that's true with, for colon cancer when it spreads to the liver, the lungs, anyplace else. And it's true for high-grade appendiceal cancer. Now, low-grade is very rarely cured. Most of the time, 
the surgeons can't get a complete side reductive surgery unless it's caught very early. And most of the time you're looking at people getting multiple surgeries over the course of their life. What winds up happening is so much scar tissue starts to develop, the, sur the bowel gets locked in and the surgeons can't do anything anymore. What's interesting is those patients don't respond to chemo. We give them the standard GI ke chemotherapy drugs, it doesn't work. Um, as opposed to the high grade disease where it does work. If I, if I think we need, um, and then when you look at the molecular profiling of these different tumor types, the higher grade disease, um, the molecular profile, um, which have been done and, and the Vanderbilt group is, is doing it again, um, looks like colon cancer for the most part, a little bit of exceptions. The low grade disease looks very different, less P53, less uh, gene ass mutations, et cetera, et cetera, looks different. Um, we definitely need something to treat all of this mucin in the belly. It is a miserable disease, absolutely miserable. Now, one of the things um, that I'm open to is, is HIPEC changing the local immune environment and creating something different. I don't think HIPEC is doing anything mechanically, uh, for instance, killing cancer cells, but is it doing something different to the local immune environment for peritoneal uh, disease in particular? But I still don't understand why this mucin is getting produced, how this mucin is getting produced, and can we block the production of this mucin, right? That is the key thing, and you'll help people live longer and feel better. The last piece I will touch on, uh, just for, for information's sake, um, I'm way out here in terms of germline. Uh, so five to 10% of every solid tumor has a germline mutation, right? I'm now at universal germline testing. I'm trying to implement at the MGH Cancer Center, you walk in the door with the cancer, you get a germline mutation testing, period. I'm actually at the point now where I think everybody should get germline testing. There's no way to risk stratify. I'm looking at the age demographic in this room. Almost all of you should have, a col have had a colonoscopy. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand to say whether you have had a colonoscopy. <laughs> but let me ask you a question. How many of you have been told you need a colonoscopy next year, you need one in three years, you need one in five years, you need one in 10 years, or maybe you're over 75 and you've been told you never need one again? That's a ridiculous statement. I, I can't walk through the halls of Mass General with that, without getting asked, hey, Dave, my colonoscopist said I need a colonoscopy and fill in the blank. And I, my first question to them is, what's your germline? You cannot risk stratify in the modern era without knowing your germline, particularly if you realize that 5 to 10% of every solid tumor that we see in uh, the cancer clinic has a germline mutation. So I will end there and be happy to join the panel. Thank you. All right, everyone. Um, JP Shen, uh, thank you so much uh, for the organizers for, for inviting me and, and really setting this up. But, you know, we were talking last night that, that as far as anyone knows, this is the first, uh, you know, scientific conference on appendiceal cancer um, that, that anyone can, that knows about. And this is really um, remarkable. Um, I've learned a lot, um, you know, in just the, the 12 hours that I've been here. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, so my training, I'm a medical oncologist. Um, I trained actually as a chemist here a very long time ago at MIT, and I worked uh, at the Broad Institute uh, briefly uh, with uh, Angela, who's here, and uh, Jay Bradner, um, before going to um, UC San Diego for my clinical training, where I worked with Trey Eidecker, who is a systems biologist. And so, uh, you know, what he had built in San Diego, I tried to rebuild on a smaller scale in, in Houston, where we have a team that mixes uh, computational scientists, so big data scientists that can analyze large data, uh, experimental validation and high, basically to generate high throughput data uh, using you know, double knockout methods uh, and others and now single cell sequencing as well as a translational team of people with medical training and uh, also skill in either computation or experiment uh, in order to kind of uh, bring this knowledge uh, together uh, for, for translation. Um, what's it, the advances? Oh, did I? Oh, was that the? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, it's, it's great that um, normally I would have to introduce, you know, yes, there is a disease with appendiceal cancer, so it's, it's great to, to have, um, you, know, the, you know, David's uh, introduction. Uh, the, the one thing I would say um, to, to, to respectfully disagree is that the, the one important mutational difference that you see uh, between colon cancer and appendiceal cancer is that uh, you don't see APC here, right? Or, you know, in colon cancer, you'd expect APC to be mutated about 80% of cases, even in high grade uh, at, uh, penicillin adenocarcinoma. Uh, APC mutation is quite rare, less than 10%, depending on, um, 
uh, depending on the case series, and you can see that the most frequently mutated genes, you know, KRAS is frequently mutated in both high grade and low grade. P53 is frequently mutated in high grade. Uh, GNAS is frequently mutated in low grade. And it's not, it's not shown in this slide, but it's very interesting that GNAS and KRAS are very strongly co-mutated. Almost 90% of GNAS mutant tumors also have a KRAS mutation, suggesting that there's a strong synergistic relationship between those genes. And GNAS mutation is mutually exclusive, statistically uh, strongly with P53, suggesting that you know, really low-grade appendicillin cancer is a different disease than high-grade tumors. High-grade tumors don't generally evolve uh, from low-grade tumors. They're kind of de novo high-grade, uh, and, and low-grade tumors are, are, are low-grade. And go goblet cell actually is, is quite different from its molecular uh, uh, makeup, and it's, it's really very interesting. We're, we're, we're at the very beginning of getting some single-cell sequencing to look at goblet cell carcinoma because, um, you know, it, it by kind of by, by definition, it is a mixed um, type of both, um, you know, a uh, neuroendocrine and adenocarcinoma. Um, and, and so, you know, I didn't, you know, set out to become a appendiceal cancer specialist, um, but it just, it just kind of happened. Um, at UC San Diego, there was a relatively large um, surgical expertise, and, you know, right now, the only really proven treatment for appendiceal cancer is surgery, and so the patients tend to follow the surgical expertise, but unfortunately, many of them are not resectable, and so they're referred to, to medical oncologists. And so, um, you know, even this is from, this was downloaded uh, last night, um, and thank you for uh, uploading my slides, even though they were sent to you very late last night. Uh, you know, as of today, the national guidelines that, that basically set this is how you should treat cancer uh, still suggest that appendiceal cancer, uh, you know, all grades, be treated with chemotherapy as if it was colon cancer. And that, that really just bothered me um, because there's, there's a lot of patients out there that are getting ineffective chemotherapy and you can't really blame the local oncologist because they're, they're following the national guidelines. And so, you know, seeing that stark difference that we know at a molecular level, pedicel cancer is very different than colon cancer. We know the natural history is very different. You know, colon cancer metastasizes to lymph nodes and then to the liver. You know, colon cancer, appendicillin cancer almost never travels to the lymph nodes, goblet cell a little bit more common. You know, but you get this isolated peritoneal disease, which, which, is, which is quite rare in colon cancer. So basically, you know, everything we know about appendiceal cancer and colon cancer tell us that they're different, and yet, and yet we have guidelines that tell us to treat it the same way. And so, um, you know, we, this, was, this was work that was started um, well before I got to MD Anderson uh, by the, the names you can see there, Mike Overman, medical oncologist, uh, Dr. Raghav, and Keith Fournier, the surgical oncologist. Um, you know, they had recognized that it doesn't seem like 5-FU-based chemotherapy is doing anything for these low-grade mucinous tumors. And, you know, medicine is, is very heavily um, biased towards what we've done before. And unfortunately, because way back when someone said, we're going to give these appendicillin tumors colon cancer chemotherapy because anatomically the appendix is next to the colon, you know, that is what we do. Um, however, you know, so this, dry, this design, it was a... Um, excuse me, randomized to either observation first, then treatment, or treatment and then observation. Uh, the patient was meant to be their own control, so every patient got six months of chemotherapy, physician's choice, and six months of observation. And, uh, you know, I mean, the fact that this was even ethical tells you a lot about the, the you know, where we are in, uh, you know, chemotherapy treatment for, uh, for appendiceal cancer. I mean, you can't think of, you know, if you said leukemia, we're going to not treat half of the people for six months. You'd be crazy, but it just tells you how, how uh, you know, how far we really need to go in terms of developing chemotherapy in this disease. And, and you know, interestingly, the, there's absolutely no difference in terms of tumor growth. You know, the tumor growth was actually even slightly, but not statistically significant, uh, faster while on treatment versus observation, which, you know, again, this is only for low-grade uh, mucinous tumors, but, you know, traditional uh, colon cancer chemo, which is 5 few based is, is ineffective. And, you know, there, there were zero objective responses on 18 patients. Uh, and we, this will, uh, hopefully it's now available on, uh, <clears throat> on bed IR card, but will soon come out in JAMA Network Open. Hopefully this will kind of end the, the practice of these low-grade patients getting treated with ineffective chemotherapy, uh, oftentimes for years because their disease is just very slow growing. So, um, you know, I'm... You know, it, uh, the, the talk about Ireland this morning kind of reminded me. I've been told by, by many that I have the, the gift of gab, and I have kissed the Barney Stone, so don't be I'm not going to talk about all of these things, but uh, I just wanted to kind of put out there, you know, given kind of this uh, problem where I mean, now at MD Anderson, we, we see a huge number of, of appendix cancer patients, and again, most of them are not surgical candidates. 
And so, you know, we, you know, the, our mission at MD Anderson is the elimination of cancer in the state of Texas, the United States, and, and the world. Uh, and our marketing people put this all over the country. And so patients come to me and they say, you know, Dr. Shen, what do you have for us? And unfortunately, there are very few clinical trials. And I really, you know, what I have to offer them is colon cancer camera therapy, which I don't really think works very well. And so we decided to tackle, you know, here's the kind of list of issues. We said, you know, all of them that we can address, let's try to address. Um, we're doing this kind of simultaneously, which is why none of these things are completed and they're all kind of in progress. And I've, I've been told that we're doing too many things and that's, that's probably true. Uh, but this is what we're trying to do. Um, so I'll just kind of touch on, on a couple of these. Um, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, because this is a rare disease and it's been hard to do clinical trials, we are actually trying to do clinical trials and it is possible to do clinical trials. Uh, in this disease, we're trying to dispel the myth that appendix cancer is too rare to do prospective clinical trials. Um, but because of that, you know, generally, um, you know, Edmund Anderson, which is obviously an academic center, only 20% of our patients go on trial. And so we realized that we need to learn more from the 80% of patients that don't go on trial. And so, you know, this, this, um, this project was not built around appendix cancer, but we've been using it. Uh, there was an um, institutional-wide collaboration between the uh, Silicon Valley-based um, uh, technology company, Palantir, uh, and MD Anderson to apply this web-based uh, graphical interface data ag aggregation system called Foundry, uh, which, which is you know, not perfect. It's not done yet. It's kind of like the second Death Star. It's, it's fully operational, uh, but it's not complete yet. Uh, but we can pull a lot of things. We can pull demographic data very well. We can pull molecular data very well. So things that were entered into the record in a structured way, we can pull really well. Uh, like op reports are synoptic. We can pull that really well. Synoptic radiology reports we can pull really well. Uh, honestly, medical oncology notes are arguably the worst uh, piece of data because we don't document things in a standardized way, but we're working on that. Um, but you can see that, you know, at MD Anderson, appendix cancer is not a rare disease. We see almost 300 new patients every year. Uh, in goblet cell, we, we see uh, around 40. And so with this, we're starting to um, aggregate these data and, um, and see what we can learn from them. Um, you know, one thing that we saw right away is that the current staging system just doesn't risk stratify very well. You know, um, all cancers are staged one, two, three, four, but the, the features that, uh, you know, but the idea of stage is that it needs to st uh, stratify patients on survival. The things that are important in breast cancer are different than the things that are important in colon cancer. And, you know, in a GI tumor, you care about how deeply invasive the tumor is um, into the body, not how big it is. And that's what the T stage is based on. You know, using a staging system that was built on colon cancer just does not work very well in appendix cancer. And you can see here that, you know, the stages one, two, three of goblet cell all do really well, but there's really no, uh, no gradation. Um, you know, stage four does worse, but there's huge variation within stage four. And I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, current staging doesn't include grade, but, you know, as uh, has been pointed out, but, you know, grade is really the most critical feature in appendix cancer. If, if there's any one thing, you know, you know, as soon as someone says this is an appendix cancer patient, the next thing we ask is, okay, what's the grade? And then, then we say, okay, who's pathologist assigned the grade because we want to make sure that uh, you know, it's a rare tumor and it's difficult, um, you know, honestly, credit to the pathologist. I've been looking at these slides uh, for a long time and I still don't think I can get it right. So it's a very difficult task, but, uh, but assigning the grade is, is critically important. It's not yet included in the staging. Uh, one thing we found, so, you know, again, this was built on colon cancer, where colon cancer is very clear that you have primary tumor, lymph node spread, hematogenous spread. Appendix cancer doesn't work like that. Interestingly, you know, in in a goblet cell adeno, you probably first have uh, spread to the peritoneum, but if you, on top of that, also have lymph node spread, you can see that there, there's a significantly worse survival. Um, also, you know, the gradation of the histology is different. Um, you know, the, um, we don't do this routinely, although we probably should. If you look at the percentage of the tumor that is goblet cell, that is uh, carcinoid versus uh, endocarcinoma is probably predictive, but also if there's if there signet ring characteristics, also worse survival. So uh, you know, this is just kind of the very first example. Now that we have this database of almost 3,000 or over 3,000 patients, so, you know, the, the amount of data we have is, is not the same. You know, we have very detailed data on the more recent patients, including molecular profiling on about 800. Um, and, you know, we have, some, um, you know, at least demographic data on about 3,500. But as we um, are starting to kind of dig through this, where we're looking for more of these uh, survival associations. So we think this is really just kind of the, the beginning of what we can do with these data. Um, 
uh, you know, one other area, you know, because as a medical oncologist, ultimately we need treatments. Um, and so I did, did not ever think of myself as being a clinical trialist, but because we didn't really have uh, options, we figured we, we had to do this. You know, one problem, um, we have a very robust phase one group uh, at MD Anderson, but unfortunately many of these patients uh, that have diffuse peritoneal disease don't have a resist, uh, resist criteria, which means that you have to have a tumor that is measurable uh, on a CT scan to, to tell you how well the investigational therapy is working, and you can have a huge amount of peritoneal disease but not meet resist criteria, which, which rules these patients out of a lot of trials. So a lot of times we're left telling people we, we have nothing, which is, which is really, um, you know, really heartbreaking. Uh, and so with the uh, mouse models that we have, and you know, two of these were uh, gifted to us by uh, Dr. Flatmark uh, from the University of Oslo, who couldn't be here, uh, that we've reconstituted. Um, we, we've shown in you know, three out of three mice that we get a very robust response from paclitaxel uh, when given intraperitoneal, uh, which is similar um, to the trial that Dr. Blakely mentioned. And so we're trying to open a complementary trial uh, at MD Anderson, which, which we hope will, uh, hopefully will enroll patients uh, in this calendar year. Um, and so that's, um, that, we'll kind of stop there. Um, I put a lot of other stuff up there that, that I'd love to talk to you guys about offline, but I don't want it to uh, monopolize the time. So I want to thank um, the, the lab and uh, our collaborators there, Anderson, and, and thank you so much uh, for this invitation. Well, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to present today. Um, what you've done, uh, accumulating such a huge brain power in such a short notice is amazing. I, I didn't expect that to happen, but congratulations for that. So I will try to demonstrate to you how we use organoid technology to tackle the problem of appendiceal cancer. And, um, you know, these are my disclosures. I have to take a break here and say, that, you know, that ACPMP, that most people they don't realize that it's a research foundation, is working with us for many, many years, since 2016 funded a big part of this uh, uh, preliminary data, and uh, we have to thank them specially. So when, uh, when we started back in 2016 uh, using organoids, and for those who doesn't know what an organoid is, I think of an organoid like a, an avatar of the tumor outside the body that you can use to do various testing. So you take the tumor, you dissociate the tumor, you drop the tumor into a hydrogel, and you keep it alive for as long as you need it to uh, do the testing that you need. And uh, this is an, the first ever appendiceal cancer organoid that was built back in 2016, 2017. And uh, you can use it for not only an appendiceal organoid, any, any organoid, any tumor organoid, you use it to create chemosensitivity data. So you can see different uh, drugs on the left column and the different uh, um, survival of the tumor in the uh, other column. And when the red is, red is dead and green is alive, you can very well and easily say that, you know, the best drug for this patient is the last one that leaves only 11% of the tumor alive. And uh, at the same time, you know, we developed this technology that we uh, took the tumor, the tumor organoid, and we enriched the tumor organoid with the immune system from the same patient. Because to have an immune system is of paramount importance to study the immunotherapy uh, response, because if you don't have an immune system with the organoid, there is no uh, immunotherapy testing, right? And what you can see here is you on the lower uh, side, you see tumor-only organoid without an immune system. When you hit it with immunotherapy, the tumor doesn't die because there is no immune system. When you add the immunotherapy and you hit it with, immunotherapy, with the immune system, then the immunotherapy activates the immune system and the tumor dies. And we were ecstatic at that point, right? That was back in 2017. And we were ecstatic because we say, well, exactly what JP was saying before, you give chemotherapy today and you have no idea if the chemotherapy is gonna work or not. Because the chemotherapy comes through what? Through prospective randomized trials, right? And the trial can tell you how a group of patients will fare, but how the individual patient will fare within this group is totally unknown. And we were hoping that we would generate like personalized data for every individual patient. But then we realized that, you know, the problem is clonality. The problem is that it's not that your data are not accurate. I mean, you, that, that has been published, right? The positive predictive value is 88%, the negative predictive value is 100%. But the problem is that when you reach state of disease like that, and this is the appendiceal cancer, right? This is what we are talking today. 
you don't have one tumor within the patient. You have hundreds of tumors within the patient. And every tumor is different. And how do we know that? We know that because we have done the work. When you take one and take each one of these tumors and you analyze them, you will see that genetically they have evolved. They are different tumors. And you can do the sequencing and you can go and say, you know what? You can tell where it started, where it went, where's the second station, where's the third station. And why this is important? And how this, uh, why this is important? Because if you take, it gives you how big of a problem that is when we were trying to generate the first appendiceal cancer cell lines from one cubic centimeter of tumor, we generated eight cell lines, right? So if you have an abdomen like that with hundreds of tumors, how many different tumors do you have within this patient? And why this is this a problem? This is a problem because when you take these tumors and you create organoids, you build these organoids and you test them under the same conditions with the same drugs, every tumor within the abdomen responds differently. So why do we give chemotherapy for three to six months with the same drug when after three months, whatever is gonna die is gonna die, and then you just offer toxicity to the patient without any benefit? So, at least in my mind, if you want to cure cancer, not appendiceal cancer, to cure any cancer, because it's a, this is a problem with any tumor, right? You need to know how many clones you have within the patient. You need to know what is the relative volume of each clone within the patient. 80%, 20%, 5%, what is the, the, the biggest volume of clone, right? You need to know what is the virulence of each clone. Because if you have a tumor that is like 20% of the patient is like a high virulent tumor clone, probably you have to tackle this one first and not tackle like the 80% that's a low grade. And what is the clone specificity to drugs? Each clone of them. And today, either we like it or we don't like it, we don't have this information. And I don't know even if we have the technology to tackle this problem. But what can read clonality is our own immune system. Not always, but quite often under the right conditions. And does it happen within the patient? Yes, it does. I mean, we have the TILs. We have the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So the immune system, essentially the immune system is infiltrating the tumor with the TILs. And who is trying to commercialize that today is IOVANS, it's predominantly for melanoma lung and cervical. And why we believe that IOVANS will not succeed in appendiceal cancer? Because Appendiceal cancer quite often attracts a very small number of TILs. And these TILs are quite often exhausted because they are pushing against a negative micro, tumor microenvironment and they run out of fuel, if I can say that. So we said, okay, if we have a system, if we have a tumor that does not attract TILs, and when it attracts TILs, they are exhausted, we're gonna generate this platform that we're gonna create TILs on demand for any patient we like, any tumor we like, any time we like, under any condition we like. So we created, we call them oils, we call them organoid infiltrated lymphocytes, and what we are doing is we have this microfluidic uh, tumor on a chip platform. The tumor is growing in these wells. You have inflow, outflow cannulas. You have the peristaltic pump that is like a circulation of the system. And this tumor is not that we place in this system, it's not a tumor only. It's tumor along with APC cells from the same patient. We are surgeons, we remove organs with lymph nodes and quite often we remove the spleen. Both lymph nodes and the spleen have APC cells, adjacent presenting cells. These are like fundamental to give you like an adaptive immunity response. So we take the cells of the tumor, we take the APC cells and we mix them. Now the antigens of the tumor are presented on the APC cells of the same patient that are not product, product of maturation. They are, these are like mature APC cells. And then we take the peripheral blood of the patient, we circulate the peripheral blood for four days through that device, and four days later we have a population of T cells that can recognize these tumors. And how do we know that, you know, TILs and TOILs are functioning in the same way. How do we know that oils are like tills on demand? We did special immune profiling and we placed, we created oils from the same tumor. We took the tills, we 
throw them head to head against the patient's own tumor. And we, can, we saw that they both activate the same apoptotic pathways, probably oils a little bit better than teals. And then how do we know that the oils are like a viable cell that is vibrant? You go back and you do sickle cell proteomics. And when you, have, when you check the teals, and you check how many proteins each cell is producing, teals, 12% of the time, they secrete between 12 and 15, uh, two, 2 and 5 proteins. When oil secretes about 2 to 5 proteins, about 32% of the time. And it's not any proteins. It's like effector proteins, stimulatory proteins, stimulatory proteins, regulatory. And they always help outperform the, the TILs. And what happens if you throw these cells against appendiceal cancer? Well, I mean, that's the response that TILs have, this faded thing. That's the response that oils have in terms of what they secrete. And what's happening if you test the oils against the tumor that you preserve? So when a T cell that has learned to recognize the tumor sees the tumor, it multiplies because the T, T cell, it's like, it's a, it's a normal function of the T cell. So that's what's happening. Here you see the tumor, this is the tumor that was growing in the patient, added immunotherapy from, from three centimeters to 30 centimeters. We removed it, we created the oils, and uh, this is a live video over 18 hours. The green color is apoptosis. So they encircle the tumor, they multiply like piranhas, and they attack it and kill it. So this is our way to tackle clonality. And uh, what's the plan? The plan is we have the IP. We have an established surgical specimen pipeline. We have already generated 700 uh, tumors into organoids. We are NCI funded. Uh, we have money from philanthropy and ACPMP with another grant that we just got. We don't expand sales, right? We do not expand sales. We are not in the expansion business. I actually, we avoid expanding sales like the plague because we know that you know after seven expansions, seven, seven passages, you don't have the same cell anymore, right? You are treating a different tumor. The oils are available within three weeks. We have a GMP facility. We are building a clear lab. We started a company. We do starting an animal model. And we're going to do, we are going to go with a phase one trial. And the phase one trial is going to be taking the cells, do the satellite induction, HIPEC or no HIPEC. We are not focusing on the HIPEC here, but HIPEC offers some kind of immunosuppression within the peritoneal cavity, and then drop them in the abdomen and see what's going to happen. And from that, I will stop. It's a, this is who we are, if you want to go and uh, uh, see us uh, online. Uh, but thank you very much for your attention. Okay, good morning. I know I'm the last person in this session, so I will try to be brief, but I'll try to um, leave you with hopefully some actionable items. Um, I'm Mike Yaffe. I'm the director of the MIT Center for Precision Cancer Medicine. I'm also an acute care surgeon and surgical intensivist, and so I've had the unfortunate opportunity to be able to diagnose several of my patients with appendiceal cancer who I was operating on for what I thought was either acute appendicitis or an acute abdomen. And for the last 25 years or so, what my lab has worked on has primarily been understanding signal transduction pathways that relate the what we do and find in surgery as far as the tumor biology is concerned to the response to chemotherapy and radiation. And that's what I want to tell you about today. Um, now, in the, in, I'm going to make four key points today. Um, and I'm going to be very iconoclastic, and I'm going to be the disruptor that Jane wants. And I also want to pick up the gauntlet that Stephen threw down and say, I really want to focus on things that are going to result in actionable items in the short term. So the first point I want to make is that the combination treatments, and you heard this from JP and you heard this from David, the, the current combination treatments for appendiceal cancer. I'm going to show you they're not synergistic and they're not even additive. They work, but they most likely work not because of the effect of the drugs in some synergistic way, but they work because we're targeting either tumor heterogeneity or patient heterogeneity. But what that means is we're exposing a lot of patients to the detriment and the side effects of some of these agents, which probably are not 
functioning very effectively to kill their tumor. Let me show you what I mean by that. Now, every clinician here will agree with me, I hope, that cytotoxic chemotherapy works because we're targeting rapidly proliferating cells. And most cancer cells have some type of defect in DNA damage response. This obviously is a problem for things like lamins, which are not rapidly proliferating. And I'll try and show you why perhaps the second idea of the DNA damage response may be flawed as well. Now, as you've heard, most of the current care therapies that we use based on NCCN guidelines are based on using 5-FU. And two combinations I want to talk about specifically. One is Folfox, combination of folinic acid, 5-fluorouracil, and oxaliplatin. And the concept here is that 5-fluorouracil is well known to act by targeting thymidylate synthase, an enzyme that's important for synthesizing nucleotides. And so the logic is that if you cause DNA damage by using oxaliplatin to cause crosslinks, and at the same time, you deplete the cells of the nucleotides that they need for DNA repair, you should get synergistic cell killing. The same thing is true with Fulfiri. Fulfiri is the same thing, ful folinic acid and 5-fluorouracil, this time with a renotecan, a topoisomerase inhibitor. And the concept is exactly the same. If we cause DNA damage at the same time that we disrupt nucleotides, one would expect that these therapies should be synergistic. And so, about 10 years ago, we set out to see if this was true. And what I'm showing you in this curve is the viability of colon cancer cells that are treated with 5-FU alone, that's in the red curve, or 5-FU plus oxaliplatin in the blue curve. And the gray curve shows what you would expect if these drugs were just additive. Okay, and so we can look at the amount of death that we observed. Blue is more death, what we expected to observe. And then we can take the difference between them. And in this case, anything blue is bad. Blue means that this combination was not even additive. It was actually antagonistic. One drug is actually acting against the effects of the other drug. We were kind of surprised to see that in nearly every cell line, nearly every colon cancer cell line that we treated, this combination was antagonistic. This is, these are the drugs that we're actively treating our patients with. Almost every cell line. Antagonistic between 5-FU and oxaliplatin, that's Folfox, between 5-FU and arinotecan, that's Folfiri, or the combination of Folfirinox. Now, you might say, okay, Mike, that's, that's cell lines. What does this have to do with real patients? And so together with Adam Palmer's group, we went back and we looked at clinical data from patients. Now, this is old data, but this is clinical data from patients that were treated with colon cancer, treated primarily with oxaliplatin alone, or with 5-FU and leucovorin in the age when I trained, or arinotecan alone, or, arin or 5-FU and leucovorin. And then we said, what would we expect if we had a population of patients, some of whose tumors only responded to oxaliplatin, and others' tumors only responded to 5-FU and leucovorin, or arinotecan in that combination. And that's what I'm showing you here in black. That's what you would expect if these patients' tumors only responded to one of the agents. And I hope you'll notice here that in the case of Folfox, at best, Folfox, this is the real data. The data for Folfox comes out and it says, at best, it's additive. Here's the data for Fulfiri. That's the red curve you see here. It's worse than additive. We're getting a worse response in these patients by the chemotherapy that we're giving them than if we could just identify which patients we should be giving a renotecan to or oxaliplatin and which patients we should be giving 5-FU and leucovorin to. Okay, so clearly the combination works, but it's not working effectively. It's working because we're targeting either patient or tumor heterogeneity. And again, this means we're subjecting people to side effects that maybe we don't need to. Well, the second point I wanna make is that many of the effective drugs in colon cancer do not work by the mechanisms that the textbooks tell us. I'm gonna show you some new data, unpublished but hopefully published soon, that these drugs actually work through a different mechanism. And this is gonna open up a relatively unexplored therapeutic space. So, if thymidylate synthase is really the target of 5-FU, then you would expect thymidylate synthase expression should correlate with sensitivity or resistance to 5-FU. This is from the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia. The, this is the rank ordering of genes that correlate with sensitivity or resistance. There's thymidylate synthase, absolutely in the middle of the curve. Okay. We went back and we analyzed the data from the Fulfiri trial and the Folfox trial into people who responded and didn't respond. And then we looked at the expression of thymidylate synthase. And you can see here there's no difference. Clearly, part of the reason that we don't have effective chemotherapies is because we don't know how the drugs we're using are working. Okay, and so the concept that 
this drug inhibited thymidylate synthase or that it inhibited DNA, that's not correct. And I'm going to sum up, unfortunately, a decade's worth of work in about two slides and tell you that, in fact, 5-FU gets metabolized into one metabolite that causes RNA damage, one metabolite that causes DNA damage. And after a tremendous amount of work, now we've been able to profile the sensitivity of colon cancer cells to these two different 5-FU metabolites. Green is the sensitivity to the RNA-damaging metabolite. Blue is the sensitivity to the DNA-damaging metabolite. And we can look at the ratio of the IC50s. And anything below this zero line means these are cells that are more sensitive to the RNA-damaging metabolite. Every colon cancer cell we looked at, much more sensitive to the RNA-damaging metabolite. Maybe this is an artifact of cells and culture. And so together with Amr Yilmaz, we made primary human colon cancer organoids from surgical specimens that we resected. And again, we could look at the survival. And I'm showing you here that in every single one of these organoids, they were much more sensitive to the RNA-damaging metabolite than the DNA-damaging metabolite. In fact, we went on to use phosphoproteomics and ubiquitin proteomics. And what we found was that in response to 5-FU, or the RNA-damaging metabolite, the main thing that we observe is profound ubiquitination of almost every protein in the ribosome. Okay. In fact, if I go back one, in fact, we could show Yes, I'm right. There we go. We could show that in response to treatment with, with the RNA-damaging metabolite, there's a profound drop in the number of ribosomes in the cell. That's not true with the DNA-damaging metabolite. And so our current model of how this drug works is it gets incorporated into RNA, ribosomal RNA that's actively being transcribed. And this results in degradation of the ribosomal RNA, degradation of the ribosomal proteins. And we've now shown that it's that RNA damage induced cell death that's responsible for the lethality of 5-FU. What about the other components that we use? What about oxaliplatin? And so over the last seven years, we've been doing a genome-wide CRISPR eye screen to look at the targets of oxaliplatin. CRISPR eye, is, I would argue, is better than CRISPR because it's a knockdown technology. It much more closely uh, resembles drug mimicking effects. And we were a little surprised to find that actually the key targets of oxaliplatin, the things that sensitize tumor cells to oxaliplatin, are things that are involved in ribosome biogenesis or RNA splicing. All of these proteins that, uh, that you see here, which dramatically sensitize cells to 5-FU, are involved in RNA biogenesis. Okay. What, what, why might this be important? After all, the standard treatment that we use, that my colleague Andrew Blakely uses um, to treat appendiceal cancer is HIPEC. Now, I am a big fan of HIPEC. Maybe it's because I'm a surgeon, David, but I am a big fan of HIPEC. But I think the problem is we don't really know what drugs to use HIPEC with. We have to go beyond Dr. Sugarbaker, and we haven't done that yet. In fact, I would show you that mitomycin C, which is the main drug that we go to initially for HIPEC, the mechanism of this drug is really not known because it hasn't been studied in over 15 years, except for this paper that came out 13 years ago from Chris Pizos, who makes the argument that mitomycin C works because it inhibits ribosomal RNA. This is a whole therapeutic space that we should be targeting that we are not targeting at the moment. Okay. Time, uh, timing of drug, two more points to make very quickly. I want to point out that the timing of drug co-administration matters. This is a, a story, this is a paper, this is a work that we did. This was in breast cancer cells, but I'll make the argument it probably applies in colon cancer cells. We took breast cancer cells, we exposed them to erlotinib, an EGFR inhibitor, or doxorubicin, or the combination. Not much benefit if you combine them. But if you wait, if you give them the erlotinib, and you wait somewhere between 4 and 24 hours, you can increase cell killing by 500%. Now, it depends. You have to find the driver. In these cells, these cells were driven by the EGF receptor. If we do the same thing with cells that are driven by a different family member, now, in fact, this time-staggered combination is even less effective than giving chemotherapy alone. When we give patients full FOX or full FIRI, we pay no attention whatsoever, really, to the order in which we administer things. In, our, in, our, in, in my center, the order in which we administer drugs is determined by what the pharmacist decides to send us first. In fact, you can make a nanoparticle that delivers both drugs with a time stagger, and compared to treating mice with doxorubicin liposomes alone, this combination actually results in tumor regression. In fact, doing phosphoproteomics, we were able to identify the mechanism of this effect. That's because if we know what the driver is, which in these tumors is the EGF receptor, and we inhibit it chronically, we can, we can silence an oncogenic signature and unveil a DNA damage pathway that is actively being silenced. And this meant 
in our case, that we were able to identify a biomarker for patient selection. If we could do this in appendiceal cancer and we knew what the driver was, we would know what drug to give. And we also then had a biomarker for the patient's response. Why can't we do a similar regimen or similar biomarkers for appendiceal cancer? And I will say, um, in that regard, that we already have one of those drugs as a liposomal product, and that's liposomal arenotecan. And in the way of full disclosure, this product was created by a, a company that I was one of the co-founders of. Okay, last point, one slide. I want to make the point, and I think, I think that JP really made this as well, and that is that we can use DNA damaging drugs to induce tumor immunogenicity. And that means that we can enhance the response to immunotherapy, but I want to point out that this is not trivial to do. And in fact, it, to do it effectively, you have to do it in very non-obvious ways. In fact, what we found was if you took mice with tumors and you injected a DNA-damaging drug directly into the tumor, and then you gave them chemotherapy, immunotherapy, absolutely no benefit. But if we took the mice, excised a piece of the tumor, treated the tumor ex vivo with the right drug at the right dose, and then re-injected those injured live cells back into the tumor and then gave the mice anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1. In fact, I hope you can see here, this is the response to giving the cells alone. There's no benefit. This is tumor growth over time. This is if you use a checkpoint inhibitor, a very modest benefit. But if you combine this combination of DNA-damaged live injured cells with immunotherapy, 40% of the mice were cured. In fact, if we took those mice that were cured and then we re-challenged them, we re-injected them with live tumor cells, all of the naive mice grew tumors, absolutely none of these cured animals developed tumors. This means we've established immune memory by treatments that we could use today. Okay. This, I think, is the future of HIPAC or EPIC or PIPAC. We need to reinvestigate what drugs we're using. And the goal, I would argue, should not be to kill the tumor cells. It should be to convert those tumor cells into an immunogenic state that we can then co-target with immunotherapy. Okay, so I've made these four key points and uh, in the interest of time, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. We are gonna steal 15 minutes of the break to take questions. Um, questions? David, yes. Well, thank all the panel members for their very interesting comments. I was curious, um, David's comment about the 15% of patients that post-resection actually are cured. And I'm wondering if those patients have ever been HLA typed or their T cell responses have been profiled to understand what role their immune system might be playing in their survival. Not to my knowledge, I haven't seen data like that, but I, you raise a really good point, which is um, uh, we don't really understand the immune microenvironment uh, of the peritoneal cavity all that well. And there's an emerging concept with, particularly in GI cancers where, uh, for instance, the liver is very immunosuppressive. If you have liver metastases, um, the uh, current PD-1, CTLA-4 combinations don't work. Uh, but if you have lung metastases or lymph node metastases, and it's questionable whether it's peritoneals included in this, there is some level of activity. And we saw that with the recent agenis, uh, the enhanced FCR binding with the, the agenis compound presented at ASCO GI in January. No responses for anybody with liver metastases. All of that is to say, we don't understand the peritoneal uh, immunosuppressive microenvironment or uh, immuno-enhancing microenvironment of the peritoneal cavity. We don't understand it at all, as far as, far as I know. Todd. Yeah. Hi, Larry Norton, Hi. Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, has anybody genotyped these tills? Clonal hematopoiesis is turning out to be a pretty important topic. You know, uh, we're, we're essentially finding probably 95% of primary breast cancers have mutant tills, um, and, uh, and now laboratory data uh, with my colleagues, Ross Levine, and. Paulo Sanchez is showing that they promote metastases of the kind that you're seeing, which is small little foci of metastases that are that are surround that are infiltrated by these mutant tills. Has anybody looked at that? Not that I'm aware. In in this cancer, I mean, it'd be pretty easy to measure um, clonal hematopoiesis in the GAP program, for example. I mean, maybe that's something you should consider. 
Hi, Kieran Traga from Yale uh, in the back here. Um, actually, more of a philosophical question for all of you. Um, do you believe that in a rare disease, scientific progress is better if every individual institution is sort of pursuing you know, the multi-omics approach, systems biology approach um, in that way? Or is it better to be collaborative? And, and if so, if the latter is the case, um, how best or have you seen platforms where groups of scientists have gotten together and said, well, let Wake Forest do organoids, they do it so well, let Andriana do uh, germline because she does it so well, and let's all of us push towards that so that we can you know, not keep replicating the same efforts. Yeah, I'll take it. Karen, thanks for a great question. I think we're open to that, at least from a gap perspective. It's why we opened Gap Nationwide. One, we really wanted those numbers, but two, you know, colleagues on this panel that do other pieces better, or a lot of my patients have had MSK impact panel testing and have that sub, sub panel and trying to expand that. So I think there are marked opportunities to kind of bring that multidisciplinary approach and really layer that data from the primary primary tumor, which we don't know a lot about, but then into the peritoneal metastases as well. Kieran, I'll follow up on that as well. I think um, it, there's clearly, we have to start collaborating on this. I think there are two points, though. One is, the, and that's what the whole second half of this symposium is going to be about. In, in order to collaborate, there has to be a financial incentive for groups to want to do that. And then I think the second thing is everyone should not while we want to share some models, it's important that there be other individual models. Because if everyone's working on one model, and then we discover that that model actually isn't necessarily representative, then we've lost a lot of ground. So it's some combination um, of shared models and unique models. The only, the only thing I would like to say on that is that, you know, whoever wants to develop organoid techniques at his institution, I mean, they are more than welcome to come in North Carolina, and we will train your techs. I mean, if you want to do that, we are very open, right? We don't have a secret source. We don't have any of that. We published every single detail in the manuscripts that we publish. And actually, we insist in the techniques to be uh, very comprehensive because we really want to go forward. I mean, we don't need any more silos in this rare disease era. Yeah, I mean, just to echo that, I mean, I think that, um, you know, we, we would love to be collaborative. As, as uh, Dr. Yaffe said, I think that there does have to be attention to the, the infrastructure uh, just because, you know, a, a lot of investigators would like to collaborate, but then you, you know, that it's squashed at a, at a higher level at, at the universities that we work at. Um, and uh, at least at MD Anderson, we don't, you know, the rank and file don't have a lot of control over the, the senior administration. Uh, and so I think that that has to be addressed as well. But, um, you know, we, you know, I think this is a great start. And, you know, you know, obviously that was one of the main goals of this uh, meeting to, is to, to foster collaboration. I think, I think it is working. Hi, this is Chris Wilfong, 76 Bio. Um, I'm curious as somebody who thinks a lot from the development of new therapeutic side, there's this consistent theme across what we're testing in peritoneal disease, appendiceal cancer, essentially combinations of things that people have been using for a very long time. And there are a lot of new models, a lot of preclinical research on new pathways, opportunities to try new therapeutics. But then you have this issue of, Dr. Blakely, you're not a phase one center, or you know, Dr. Shen, you brought up the fact that rhesus criteria don't work well in phase one. So how do you think about assessing a new therapy for whether it's appendiceal cancer or any peritoneal disease? How do you actually, as a clinician, look and see if you're seeing activity that you believe in from a new therapeutic? So I think um, I'll take a crack at that because that it's really hard to do an appendiceal cancer. I think for the low for the high grade uh, tumors which have a lot of omental uh, carcinomatosis and there's a very clear cut um, uh, there's not so much variability around progression pre survival. You can actually measure reduction in the amount of solid tumor and solid component, and you can also look at progression pre survival. But that's not really what we're talking about. I think the 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 low-grade mucinous appendiceal tumors with a lot of mucin in the abdominal cavity, it's incredibly difficult to do a clinical trial. Um, a, the progression-free survival is, can be years in some of these patients. B, um, you know, the, the amount of, of uh, mucin that's in the abdominal cavity 
varies from scan to scan, even if it hasn't changed, it's shifted. Uh, and so it's really hard to know if your drug is working. Having said that, the first person who comes up with a therapeutic modality where there's, um, you can measure the volume of mucin, let's say, total, and then all of a sudden it's cut by 50% or uh, 75% in, in six months, like that will be a breakthrough and then, and then everything will change. So there is an ability to do it, but not, not along the standard resist criteria. And, and essentially, it's, you know, you're, it almost feels like you're asking for a miracle uh, to be able to do that right now, because I've certainly never seen that um, other than a surgeon going in and mechanically removing all of that mucin. I will add something to that, specifically for the low grade appendiceal cancer, because this is a, these are tumors that are very, with very low cellularity. So it's a sequencing nightmare. You send a piece of tumor like that, and they're telling you we have no cells, right? So maybe you have to see them as a, as a secretion problem, and not like as a cancer problem, right? So if you target the secretion of mucin, maybe you have better outcomes than target, targeting the tumor itself, because this tumor itself is very slow growing, with the exception of the tumor, you know, that over years will become like a, um, the differentiate and it will become a high grade and that's gonna be game over. Now, regarding how you're gonna approach a rare disease, I think you have to remove the word rare from the rare disease sentence, right? And we do have like a way to do that. And what is a way to do that? We can create huge um, tumor banks that are not gonna be the traditional tumor bank, you know, that you have like FPPs and this kind of stuff, but you can have like living tissue tumor banks. And the way you do that, you have two ways to go, right? Either you will do the uh, European type of organoids where you take cells and you, you know, you um, expand them forever and uh, you may be lucky or may not be lucky to create like a, a, a tumor organoid like months later, especially for appendiceal cancer, or maintain the tumor alive exactly as we do in North Carolina. And you keep the tumor along with the stroma and you keep them alive for a period of time, frozen in the, in the somewhere, right? And then over time, you will be able to have like 300 cases, 400 cases, 500 cases. They won't live forever, but as patients come in, if you have a system to replenish all the tumors that you have used, you will always have a set of 300 different patients tumors for three other different patients to do your triage of agents, right? So you have to find a way to remove the word rare from the rare disease. If you don't do that, we will all be chasing ourselves, right? I mean, we cannot have a clinical trial. We cannot really have a, a good uh, a specimen cohort. Uh, with the, or the sequence is not good. I mean, uh, uh, when is going to be the next patient coming through the clinic? We, we cannot do that anymore. Um, yeah, just to, to, to echo that, so I, mean, I, I agree that, you know, with, with the challenges as, as outlined, uh, you know, one thought, you know, we, we've looked uh, quite a bit at cTDNA, which, um, you know, it's not, we presented this uh, at ESMO GI last year, and the, the manuscript came out really too soon, but it's unfortunately not very sensitive in low-grade tumors. Uh, but as a next step, we thinking about um, profiling the peritoneal fluid. And so, you know, in the trial that we have proposed, um, because you have to place the intraperitoneal cath and do a diagnostic staging initially, you'll, you'll have, you know, which is the gold, still the gold standard, diagnostic laparoscopy, uh, we'll also take uh, peritoneal fluid sampling. And so potentially you could look at, you know, tumor DNA in the peritoneal fluid, which, which you, you know, it's still invasive to sample that. Um, but, um, you know, perhaps you wouldn't have to do the full uh, diagnostic surgery. Uh, and with regards to the mucin, um, you know, we're, this is something that we're also very interested in. I didn't, I didn't put it up there because I, uh, for interest of time, but, uh, you know, we showed in colon cancer, GNAS mutant colon cancer cell lines, if you knock out GNAS, you get, uh, you know, reduction in uh, mucin, like MUC9, MUC5A, and also, like, the tumors are less mucinous. And so uh, we're, we're pursuing that uh, as a strategy, you know, target, uh, you know, chemical inhibition of GNAS as a strategy to um, target the, the mucin production in, in these low-grade tumors. Um, but I think that, you know, like from a, you know, again, uh, Dave, what you said about the radiologist being able to determine the grade, you know, based on the image, we think that, um, you know, with an MRI, you're throwing away a lot of that information just to get an image. And so uh, we really, you know, need to find someone that's smarter than us that really is a, a, a true uh, uh, radiologist to think about a radiomic approach. You know, can we see what... Um, you know, the difference between a treated tumor and a, and a you know, like fibrosis from a chemotherapy effect um, versus 
um, versus not. And so I think that potentially that information is there, in, and especially in the MRI, but we're, we're just not pulling it out with the current, uh, like, you know, T1, T2 modalities. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to wrap up. But Andrew, do you just have a comment sorry, or a question? Just sorry, I wanted to ask um, Jerry Lee to just say a few words to follow the question about tumor banks, because I think there's an important uh, initiative that's going on that everybody should know about. Uh, Jerry? Yeah. No, thank you so much, Jerry Lee, uh, USC, formerly uh, National Cancer Institute, and I think JP and David and Adriana, when you were speaking a little bit about uh, looking at that, that TLN, had the good fortune uh, spending 12 years with Anna Barker when we built the Cancer Genome Atlas. And even 17 years later, I'm still staring at the tail that's on that genomic data commons of all those N of 11111. Uh, and I think Andrew, uh, as always, uh, graciously uh, wanted to, to raise awareness of something that Greg uh, and I actually, as part of the Cancer Moonshot One, put together as a, a consortium between Department of Defense and Veterans Affairs to, to actually put together now a longitudinal data set uh, and a longitudinal data set that others can contribute to. Uh, and we are biobanking uh, now over 2,000 samples, similar to TCJ, where, where our very first paper went out uh, last November. Uh, and hopefully others that are not yet aware of this, we'd be happy to sort of speak with you a little bit about that um, as we continue this longitudinal cohort and hopefully have other uh, uh, cases, uh, including um, taking a look at the first 2,000 had, had have already been biobanked uh, of high quality. We actually have four cases of appendicitial cancers that, that might also be something we can think about how to uh, enable what JP mentioned, uh, algorithms and computational scientists that might need one set to train and one set to validate. So it doesn't necessarily always have to be one bank per se. But if that's something that'd be helpful to contribute to, it's a public-private resource. Again, lots of credit to, to Greg as well, believing in that project uh, as part of Moonshot One. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Um, we are going to take a break. We'd like you to come back at 11.